Amen. Amen. Don't you love it when Jeremy sings in Hebrew? <laughs> thank you, brother. First of all, thank you for praying for us. We believe me when I tell you. <laughs> that we know and we feel your prayers. Um, we get lifted on the wings. Even though we might face challenges on the road and uh, 53 hours on a plane seat uh, we, uh, health even crumbled for a few days, but we recover so quickly because we know people are praying for us. Amen. And so we know also, as we lift up the name of Jesus, uh, we are confident that his word will not return to him void. Amen. As we circle the world and we see the church in, in the West and the church in the Middle East and and we see the work of God, we, I am personally convinced uh, that the Lord is near. And uh, meanwhile, I'm very grateful for Jonathan, for his ministry here. He will soon be Dr. Jonathan Youssef. He's going to take it up with me afterward. He doesn't like that attention. <laughs> but while I'm at it, let me tell you, since we talk about the next generation, on April 14th is we have a lunch for all of you who are considering joining apostles and be part of this family of believers. That's Sunday, April 14th, right after church. And the team has really asked me to request that you would pray if God is leading you to be part of this family of God here at Apostles, come. And that's when you'll hear about the vision for the future from the next generation leaders. And so I pray that uh, you would come uh, prepared uh, as to, you're not obligated, uh, but you just find out what the vision and the mission of the church is. And um, go to apostles.org or talk to Mary O'Brien. She would love to talk with you. Uh, Lord, we don't take for granted every breath that we uh, draw is a gift from you. Uh, the very life that we have is by order from you. And Lord, we know that you promise is that you would hold us in the hollows of your hands until uh, the time our place in heaven is prepared and ready and then you'll come and take us home. And Lord, meanwhile, while we're in this world, help us to live for Christ and to be ambassadors of the King of Kings. For it is in his holy, mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, after Solomon completed building of the temple, the priests of Israel and the leadership of, of Israel in the temple uh, they made a decision that they're going to sing a certain psalm at a certain day of the week. Every day of the week is a different psalm. For example, on Wednesdays, they sung Psalm 94. And not just once or twice, but they sang not Psalm 94 all day. And then on um, Fridays, they sung Psalm 93. Uh, and on Sundays, the day after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, they sung Psalm 24. Every Sunday, they sang Psalm 24. I'm going to share with you the significance of that in a moment. But I want you to think with me, before I even get to Psalm 24 and talk about it, I want you to please think with me uh, the, the, the incredible, amazing Sovereign 
plan of God that the temple choirs and the temple priests and the temple ministers are all singing Psalm 24 uh, on the first day of the week on Sunday. The day when the Lord Jesus Christ victoriously entered into Jerusalem, which we call Palm Sunday, and we're celebrating today. Uh, the, it, the, the, the whole apparatus in the, inside the temple, they were singing Psalm 24. Think about how incredible this event of celebration of Palm Sunday. Uh, think of how amazingly sovereign God and His plan is for them uh, as the children were singing outside in the streets of Jerusalem and waving palms and saying, Hosanna, who comes in the name of the Lord, that inside the temple, right inside of the, the, the entire religious apparatus are singing Psalm 24. Not only that, but the following Sunday, the first day of the week, which we call Resurrection Sunday, when our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and came out of that grave on Resurrection Sunday, the priests and the choirs and the ministers in the temple were singing Psalm 24. Now I want you to turn with me to Psalm 24. I think we're going to have it on the screen as well. And what I'm going to ask you to do, please stand up in honor of the Word of God. And I'm going to read the very first verse, and then I want you to read the rest of it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Now. Be seated, please. Having covered every aspect of Palm Sunday through the years, this is the one thing that was left for me to do, and that is Psalm 24 that was sung in the temple on Palm Sunday. And I pray that you will be blessed by the Word of God as I am blessed by preparing it. I want to give you a very quick historic context to this psalm, because without understanding the history behind it, it, it may not be as effective in understanding it. Uh, the nation of Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines, the enemies of God's people. Uh, and just to give you an idea, that Ark was in a huge box. It was a small box, really, probably four or five feet by f two or three feet. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were three items. Uh, first, there were the Ten Commandments, the tablets of the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. And the other item that was in that box that called the Ark of the Covenant was a jar of the manna that God rained from heaven to feed His people in the wilderness before they went to the land of promise. And in order to remind them of God's provision, 
He commanded Moses to preserve a jar of that manna that God's provided in the wilderness. The third item was the staff of Moses that he used to uh, literally uh, open the Red Sea for God's people to cross over. And God specifically told them to keep that Ark of the Covenant in their midst. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God among His people. Now, that's a key word, represented. It is a representation. It doesn't mean that God is in that box. No, that it is a representation that God is in the midst of His people. And so, think of their devastation. Think of their agony and their, their feel of loss when the Philistines came and hijacked the Ark of the Covenant and took it back to uh, Philistine. Uh, uh, don't miss this because this is really important. The power of God was not in the box. Are you with me? <laughs> it was not in that Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of the presence of God. That symbol had no power in itself any more than the bread and the wine that we have at communion have power in themselves. <laughs> the power was where? It was in the representation. The power is in the symbol that they present, represent. Uh, so when superstitious Philistines saw and understood the power of the presence of God among his people represented in that ark. They thought, well, if we can hijack that box, if we can hijack the ark of the covenant and take it to our land, we have power too, and we can have victory too. <laughs> they thought, uh, well, if, 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 if the God's people are having victory over them because of the presence of that box, so they want to take it and get that experience. So they took that symbol of the power of God. The symbol, remember, I keep repeating this, it's important. The symbol, but there's more. The Ark of the Covenant did not only represent God's presence, but it rep represented Israel's loyalty to God. <laughs> it represented the very security in their lives and the life of Israel as a nation that belongs to God. But, for seven long months, the Israelites were separated from the symbol of the presence of God in their midst. For seven long months, the enemies of God's people, the Philistines, kept that Ark of the Covenant in their midst. Uh, if they hijacked this Ark of the Covenant, uh, they thought they can hijack Yahweh's power. Oh, beloved, listen to me. There are so many churches today, they go and play church, but they have no power of the Holy Spirit of God in them. But instead, the ark, which was a blessing to Israel, which was a secret of power to Israel, has become a curse uh, to the Philistines. Uh, it became a, a source of destruction and pain and suffering and illness. I want you to think with me. Please think with me. The very source of blessing to God's people has become the source of a curse to the enemies of God's people. Beloved, the New Testament, we know, and the Word of God tells us that the cross, the cross, the cross for the unbelievers is foolishness. Ah, oh, but for those of us who believe is none other than the power of God unto salvation. Finally, after seven long months of destruction and suffering in, in the Philistinia, uh, uh, they, they finally said, take it back. Give it back to them. Uh, we, we don't want all these illnesses. We don't want all this pain and we don't want all this suffering. Take it back to the Israelites. And as you can imagine, of course, the day of the returning of that Ark of the Covenant to God's people, it was an extremely day of rejoicing. It was a day of celebration. It was a day of thanksgiving to God 
And so in the midst of this unspeakable joy, King David sits down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he writes down the Psalm, Psalm 24. He's celebrating the presence of God and joyful thanksgiving in the midst of his people. So I want to tell you three things about this psalm, just to make it easier for you to follow. Three things, Psalm 24. This is the psalm that we just read that was sung by the priests and the choir and the ministers in the temple every Sunday. And they sang it specifically on Palm Sunday and on Resurrection Sunday. So the first thing that our Lord wants us to know from His Word is this. It is His declaration of His ownership of the universe, verses 1 and 2. Secondly, the Lord's greatest offer of salvation to humanity, verses 3 to 6. And thirdly, that the Lord's ultimate victory, the Lord's ultimate victory, the Lord's ultimate victory, the Lord's ultimate victory, no, 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 I'm not stuck. I, I just want to make sure that you get it. The Lord's ultimate victory is absolutely inevitable. Amen. Verses 7 to 10. Let's look at this very quickly. The Lord's declaration of His ownership of the universe. Verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's. I love the old English translation in uh, King James. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the fullness thereof. Some of you might say, as I anticipate, wait a minute, Michael. I know that's the Word of God. I know that's what the Word of God said. But isn't the earth is Satan's? Isn't he, Satan, the prince of the air? <laughs> uh, I thought the earth controlled by Satan. Well, a good question. To be sure, there are many people on the earth belong to Satan. In fact, the vast majority of the earth population belongs to Satan. But I need to explain this, very important, listen carefully. <laughs> the Lord owns the entire universe. Amen. The countless stars and planets, the vast space empires, the unfathomable orbits, they all are His. Amen. They all are what? His. <laughs> One planet out of the millions and billions of the, the galaxies in the Milky Way, Milky Way is planet Earth. Yeah. It's a little dot, just a speck. Amen. But the tens of millions of stars that are spinning around the center of this giant disk, <laughs> which is inconceivable, <laughs> 100,000 light years, from rim to rim. All of that is what? His. Some 30,000 light years from the center of the disk, <laughs> there is a modest-sized star called the sun. The sun spins around the hub of the universe, carrying with it a family of baby stars. <laughs> C.S. Lewis, I'm not an envious person, but I can tell you this, every time I'm reading C.S. Lewis, I, I become envious. I say, I wish I could, I could express things like that, man. It was just incredible. Uh, C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, these baby stars spinning around like a, a bunch of kids holding onto mama's skirt. <laughs> that mama and her children that are holding onto her skirt orbit around the center of the galaxies once every two hundred million years. Has your mind been blown yet? Yes. And then you find a teeny weeny brain professor whose brain probably no bigger than a walnut. <laughs> and stand up arrogantly say, I don't believe there is a God. 
Right. One of these baby planets are holding onto mama's skirt <laughs> is called planet Earth. C.S. Lewis again called this planet Earth the silent planet. For it has no song. Others call planet Earth the sobbing planet because it's filled with sorrow and cries and agony, because it's filled with violence and bloodshed, because it is filled with sin and rebellion. It is filled with sleepless nights, anxious people and worried people everywhere. Yet the maker, the creator, and the owner of the whole universe focuses just on one planet, one of them, and that's Earth. The tiny speck. Why? Why not Mars? Why not Mercury? Why not Venus? Why not Saturn? Why not Neptune? Why, why not one of the others? Why planet Earth, which, as I said, a speck in relationship to the sizable planets? Simply because. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. Simply because there is nowhere in the universe does God need to assert himself and his ownership as he needs to do with planet earth? Long before Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, long before the serpent in the garden, long before creation, Lucifer, the angel of light who reflected the light of the throne of God, Lucifer who served at the throne of God, he rebelled against God. And he thought he'd conduct a coup d'etat against God and take his place. He was thrown out of heaven. And he wanted to have his domain to be the earth. But he couldn't. He couldn't. Until, until Adam handed him the deeds of the earth when he sinned and rebelled, rebelled against God. He handed it to him. And that is why God had to reinstate his authority on planet Earth. And that is why God had to rescue planet Earth uh, from the foreign invaders uh, of his property. And that is why 2,000 years ago, on the hill called Calvary, the Earth was restored back to the Lord, its rightful owner. Please... Please hear me right. No matter what the atheist says, the earth is whose? The Lord's. No matter what the agnostic says, the earth is whose? No matter what the media says, the earth is whose? No matter what some godless scientist says, the earth is what? No matter what these funky professors say, the earth is what? No matter what artificial intelligence says, the earth is whose? Amen. 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 I want to give you an illustration, but because the kids will not understand it, so I'm going to ask you parents, please, when you go home, explain that to them in details. But every adult who ever bought a house or any real estate will understand this illustration. I'm going to try and explain it to you in a simple way, experientially, that most of us who have bought a house would understand. When we buy a house or buy any real estate, we go through what they call title deed search, right? Why? To make sure that no one has claim on that property uh, which we're about to buy. And then even after we buy it, after we buy that house or the real estate, um, because we, we buy title insurance <laughs> because we want to insure this particular property uh, against any false claims that a person may have on that property. Are you with me so far? <laughs> by far, by far, by far, when God came to earth 2,000 years ago, he came so that he may claim his title deeds. 
and throw out the imposter and throw out the usurper. And that is why now Satan has no authority over Jesus' followers. He has authority only upon those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their only Savior and Lord. The Lord's ownership of the whole universe. Secondly, the Lord's offer of a lifetime. Verses 3 to 6. What is that offer of a lifetime? Look at number, uh, verse 3. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in the holy place? Answer, no one. No one. None of you, none of your pastor. No, none of us. No one is good enough or righteous enough to stand before the Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, only the high priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies. Uh, and, 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 and there, he had to go all sorts of cleansing and uh, rituals. And, and then he goes there once a year and for the briefest of times. And, and even then, he goes in with such dread and fear, lest the Lord's anger over unconfessed sin must snuff him out. That's why they had to put a bell on his foot. <laughs> you see, and he, there, he will offer a sacrifice for himself and his sins, then the sin of the people. Ah, uh, but here, <laughs> in Psalm 24... David looks forward with the eyes of faith. He looks forward with the eyes of faith to the New Testament. He looks forward with the eyes of faith to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord issues that greatest invitation, whomsoever, whomsoever, Whomsoever come, the exclusive Christ is giving an inclusive invitation. And so the question is, who can come to Christ? Verses 4 and 5 gives us the answer. Every repentant sinner, every recipient of the grace of God, everyone who would come to Jesus and crown him Lord of his and her life. Question. What evidence do these people who come to Christ should exhibit? Listen carefully. The evidence of being washed by the blood of the Lamb. The evidence of being forgiven of all of our sins by Jesus Christ. The evidence of inward and outward obedience to Christ. The evidence of their thirst and hunger for righteousness, the evidence of having the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed on them, the evidence of inward transformation of life, the evidence of a desire for holy living, the evidence of keep deep love for Jesus. Those are the evidence. Those are the evidence. Do you know the sad thing for me? Especially as I circle the world and as I see things. One of the saddest things is that professing churches are still live in the Old Testament. As if they're in the Old Testament. You say, what do you mean by that, Michael? Well, they profess with their lips but their heart's far away from him. But the psalmist, just like Abraham, before him, he looks through the eyes of faith and he sees that only those who have come to Jesus confessing their sins, that only those who are desperate for Christ's forgiveness of their sins, that those who are covered by the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus, that only those 
to who, on whom the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed will come to him. The Bible said, only Christ can wipe away our sins permanently, permanently. Only Christ removes our sins permanently, not just once a year like in the Old Testament. Oh, they didn't have to go through the process all over again every year. No, no, no. Only Christ can permanently remove our sins and the wages of our sins. Praise God. You know, the one thing God cannot do, I remember when we were Sunday schools as kids, always the teachers asked, what is the one thing God cannot do? And we always yell, sin. The one thing God cannot do is sin. But there's something else God cannot do. If you're listening, say amen. amen. Because if you're not going to get blessed your socks today, uh, there's something wrong with you. Do you know what the one thing other than not sin God cannot do, he cannot remember the sins of repentant children who come to him in repentance and faith. He cannot remember the sins of everyone who is born again. What does that mean? It means that God gets uh, some sort of a, an amnesia, right? No, no, that's not what it means. It means that he will not hold our sin against us in the day of judgment. Once you are justified, once you are redeemed, once you are adopted into his family, he does not keep a ledger. He does not keep a ledger on his own redeemed children. Praise God. Now, beloved, the Lord's ownership of the universe actually makes him to be the only one, the only one who can offer this offer of a lifetime, Amen. eternal forgiveness and eternal life in heaven with him. The Lord's ownership of the universe, the Lord's great offer of salvation, and thirdly, the Lord's conquering and winning victoriously is absolutely, categorically inevitable. Now, can you say the word inevitable with me? In, I mean, don't, don't imitate my accent, but you, you can do it your own, your own way. And you say inevitable? inevitable? Praise God. Even some of you start speaking with an accent like me. Verses 7 to 10. Look at these three verses. The psalmist asked the question, and answered it twice. He asked the same question, answered twice. Did he get that? Underline him in your Bible. In fact, five times he affirms the coming, conquering powers of Jesus Christ. Five times. As if to say, did you get this? Did you get this? Now, did you get this? Hello? Did you get it? That's what he's trying to do here. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. That's, that's how it comes across. Who is the king of glory? Twice he asks the question. Who is the king of glory? Answer, the Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Then there comes a second question. As if to say, Please hear that right. Hear me right, right? He says, that's, that's why I got it from the psalmist. He said, did you hear this? Who is the king of glory? As if to say, I want to make sure that you understand this. Get it. As if he's saying, let me say it again. So that hell may tremble. So that the devil may tremble so that the enemies of Christ may tremble. He is the King of glory. He is the almighty conquering King of glory. Our oh, beloved, please listen to me, listen to me. The world might be going to hell in a basket, but we have a conquering King coming. Hallelujah. 
the sad thing for me is that we don't reverence our awesome God. We take him for granted. Some people treat him like the little pal down the street. We don't tremble before his majesty. And that is really the core of our problems. When we cease to fear God, we're going to go to business for ourselves. Make no mistake about it. The day is coming. And I believe it is sooner than many of us think. When the whole world will tremble before the majestic power of Jesus. And listen, since I started, might as well let me finish. The reason in the Western world, and I'm familiar with it. I'm very familiar with it. The reason we have insipid churches, insipid Christianity, and insipid worship, and insipid living is because we have lost sight of the conquering king. When we think of our king going to the cross and dying and then buried, then on the third day he rose again with his omnipotent power to defeat death once and for all. That should make us tremble before his majesty. And you ask why? Why? Why did he do this? Why did he leave the splendor of heaven and come to earth, die on a cross, rise again? So that we, though so that he may win the battle for us. So that he may win the battle for us. So that he may be able to say, it is finished. So that he may be able to stand before his father in the center of the universe. And he says, Father, I've accomplished everything you asked me to accomplish. Father, I defeated Satan on the cross. Father, I've fully obeyed you and obeyed your will. Father, I have arrested the deeds of planet Earth from Satan. Therefore, now, I receive from you all of the glory that belongs to me. Who is the king of glory? Lord Almighty in the battle. Who is the king of glory? You notice he didn't say, the Lord wimpy in the struggle. (laughs) Oh, we have some false teachers and preachers all over the place who are saying God is struggling with us. God is just feeling his way with us. What an absolute hogwash. False. False. The apostle Paul said, we should know Jesus after the crawl, after the flesh, no more. And that is why the book of Revelation, literally, God permitted that book to be his last book in his uh, last uh, chapter in his book of 66 books, so that we know the victorious Christ. Listen to me. Christ came in weakness so that we may have his strength. He laid aside the splendor of his majesty so that we may receive his power. He gave up the trappings of his divinities, not his divinity, but the trappings of his divinity, so that we may have his divine nature. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me again. The conquering King Jesus is now calling his elect from every nation, every tribe, and every language. Uh, We are seeing it, listen, we're seeing it with our own eyes. Right now, I'm seeing it with my own eyes that those who were never his that those for years pretended to be his, that those who have deceived us into thinking that they are his, they're falling away now. They're falling away. And yet, others we saw with our own eyes recently can literally write their own death warrant when they get into the water of baptism, and they're coming to Christ in large numbers. I don't know what that says to you. I know what it says to me, that the Lord Jesus Christ is gathering his elect from every tribe, every language, and every nation. It tells me that the return of our conquering king is nearer than we think. The return of our conquering king is at the door. The return of our conquering king is about to sound the trumpet. The return of our conquering king is about to take place. Let me ask you this, and please answer the question to yourself. 
Does this thought thrill you or frighten you? Answer, answer it, please, to yourself. Answer it to yourself. Does this thought get you all ready and excited about seeing the conquering king and joining in the parade, or does it make you fearful and frightened? That question only you can answer to yourself. I pray to God that everyone at the sound of my voice would say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, conquering king. Come, conquering king. Stand up to your feet. Lord, we know most assuredly that we are sojourners, that we're travelers, and we're heading home. And Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus that you help us to take our eyes off ourselves, our circumstances, and all the things that surround us. And not be, not, that's not being unrealistic, but being realistic. Yes. And we place them on the conquering king. Lord, I pray for anyone who has never come to the conquering King Jesus, surrendering their life, receiving forgiveness of his sins. That would be the day today, Palm Sunday, be the day in which they'll make that all-important decision and then come and talk to one of us at the front here with the pastors. And Father, for everyone who knows you and love you, renew in us such zeal, such eagerness, to look to that day. For we pray this in that mighty name of the conquering King, King Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you.